Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, my name is Bonnie Adderstrom, and I'm the, on the events team uh, here at Brooklyn Booksmith. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to host Anne Napolitano for the release of her book, Hello Beautiful, in conversation with J. Courtney Sullivan. Thank you all for being here and for supporting these authors and our event series. Before I introduce everyone, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Firstly, if you haven't yet picked up the book you pre-ordered or you'd like to buy a copy, um, you'll be able to purchase them at the checkout back there. Uh, secondly, masks are strongly requested at this event. Um, I think someone came around with some masks before, but we have more in the back by the register there if you'd like to grab one. Um, Please keep your phones off or on silent for the duration of our uh, reading and or discussion, rather. Um, thank you for being considerate of our authors and your fellow attendees. And finally, uh, this event is being live streamed uh, on the iPad right over there. Our audience should not be visible to our live stream viewers, but if you don't want to be live on YouTube, just avoid walking in front of it. It'll probably be okay. Um, and of course, we will have a Q&A at the end of the event. Um, so hold your questions until the end, but definitely have them ready to go. And now for the fun part. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce your authors for this evening and tell you a bit about the book that we're here to celebrate. Um, our moderator tonight is J. Courtney Sullivan. She's the New York Times bestselling author of the novels Commencement, Maine, The Engagements, Saints for All Occasions, which was a New York Times Critics Pick for 2017, and a New England Book Award nominee, and most recently, Friends and Strangers, a Read with Jenna book club pick. Uh, Courtney's writing has also appeared in the New York Times Book Review, New York Magazine, and O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, among many others. She's a co-editor, along with Courtney Martin, of the essay anthology, Click, When We Knew We Were Feminists. She lives outside of Boston with her husband and two children. Anne Napolitano is the author of Dear Edward, which was an instant New York Times bestseller, a read with Jenna selection, and is now an Apple TV Plus series. In November 2019, Anne was long listed for the Simpson Joyce Carol Oates Literary Prize. She's also the author of the novels A Good Hard Look, which was an Indie Next pick, among several other awards, and Within Arm Arms Reach, which was adapted in stage as, as a theatrical production in New York City in 2014. For seven years, she was the associate editor of the literary magazine One Story, and she received an MFA from New York University. She's taught fiction writing at Brooklyn College's MFA program, New York University's School of Continuing and Professional Studies, and Gotham Writers Workshop. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two children, and of course, her latest novel is Hello Beautiful, which we are all here to celebrate. To tell you a bit about the book, Hello Beautiful tells the story of William Waters, who grew up in a house silenced by tragedy where his parents could hardly bear to look at him, much less love him. When he meets the spirited and, and ambitious Julia Padovano in his freshman year of college, it's as if the world has lit up around him. With Julia comes her family, and with the Padovanos, uh, William experiences a newfound contentment. Every moment in their house is filled with loving chaos. But then, darkness from William's past surfaces, jeopardizing not only Julia's carefully orchestrated plans for their future, but the sisters' unshakable devotion to one another. The result is a catastrophic family rift that changes their lives for generations. Hello Beautiful is an absolutely stunning homage uh, to the timeless classic Little Women, and it is a profoundly moving portrait of what is possible when we choose to love someone not in spite of who they are, but because of it. It's been lauded by Publishers Weekly, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, to name just a few, um, as the tender and moving story and retelling of Little Women. And so it's so wonderful to have Anne here to speak about it tonight. Everyone, if you could please give a warm welcome to our audience. when you're friends with a humble genius like Anne, because um, 
Uh, when I told her how much I loved the book, she was like, no, you don't, you're just saying that. And then I ended up telling her, shut up, Anne, and then I felt so bad. I'm like, I didn't even say shut up to Anne. Anyway, it's a brilliant book, and um, you'll not have to take it from me. You can take it from one Oprah Winfrey, you guys have probably heard of her, who chose Hello Beautiful as her 100th book club pick. Um, <laughs> that when we go out for lunch, it always lasts six hours. So mm -hmm. Anne's children asked if this event was going to be six hours today. Um, I'll let you know we had a three-hour lunch already, so this will just be a three-hour event. Don't worry. Um, but Anne, um, where do I want to start? Please, first of all, can you tell us your Oprah story, which you will be telling for the rest of your life. I know. Anywhere. Very, it's such a good story. I'm very happy to tell this for the rest of my life. Um, so I was... It was last October, it was five months ago, and I was taking out the garbage in my apartment building in Brooklyn, and I was standing by the mailboxes and my phone rang, and it said Chicago on it. And my uncle lives in Chicago, and I had just sent him the book, so I thought maybe it's my uncle Ed calling to say that he liked the book, which would be weird because no one in my mother's family ever talks about anything, so the fact that you would read the book and then actually call me is very unlikely, and I was like, oh, this would be interesting. And so I answered the phone, and the voice said, hi, Anne, this is Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and I was like, this is a robocall. This is like when Bill Clinton calls you and says, hi, Anne, it's Bill Clinton. I'd like you to vote for so-and-so in your local election. And I was, But also it sounded a little real, so I was just like, Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey? <laughs> and she was like, yes, it's Oprah Winfrey, and I read your book, Hello Beautiful, and I loved it so much, and I'd like it to be my March book club pick. And I was like, Oh my god. <laughs> and then like adrenaline surged through my body and I just went to take one step and the phone crackled so then for the rest of the conversation I stood completely still holding the garbage in my hand <laughs> because I was afraid that if I moved again like it would all go away. And then she proceeded to ask me all these sort of in-depth process questions about how I wrote the book and I was like this is so mean because Oprah Winfrey calls you out of the blue and then expects you to have like an intelligent, thoughtful conversation about a book I had like just finished. And when you're writing a book, you don't, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm creating a world, I live in it with my characters, like I'm very sad when I leave. And then after you finish the book, you have to figure out how to talk about it. And I had not yet figured out how to talk about it even. So I was like, making, I was just reaching for words that sounded like they fit together into intelligent um, topics. And then she hung up and, oh, at the end she said, um, your team knows about this and they know the rules. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out the rule was don't tell anyone and you have to sign a thing and, you know, very important secret, don't tell your kids or anything. Um, so then it never felt real because I told my husband, and I told two, my two best writer friends who lived, who I saw in person, like I didn't tell, I would have told you if I saw you in person, but there's no way I was telling you over the phone. Um, and then I swore these two friends to like a death pact. And because they're writers, they understood the, the stakes of the secret. Um, and uh, so it didn't feel real at all actually until last Tuesday. And then when it was announced and when I was, you know, had sat beside her on the couch. <laughs> and now it feels a little real, but still confusing, and I'm very grateful. Um, I have to tell you that when we were watching you sitting next to Oprah on the couch, uh, my four-year-old daughter, she touched the screen and she's like, Anne? And then she goes, and who is this? <laughs> like, well, sure. Okay. Um, that is Oprah, but okay. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit sort of where did this book begin? When did you start thinking about it versus when did you start writing it? Because that's sometimes that's a long time between things. And sort of, what was the origin of this particular novel? Um, yeah, so I, I have, I've developed this like system rule that works for me basically. So when I'm writing, I call it, um, what I like to do best is what I call write, write pretty sentences which means like I'm in a scene and I'm like following some kind of lyricism of the language and things are happening, but I'm not sure what they are and like surprises occur. 
But the thing is, when I write like that, I can't think with like the analytical part of my brain at all. So like as far as figuring stuff out, I can't do it. So now what I do is for basically the year before I start a book, I'm not allowed to write pretty sentences. I, I can't write. I can research, I can take notes, and I can think. And so I was in that thinking stage basically for um, a year. And then in April 2020, it had been a year. And coincidentally, the pandemic had just started and we were all inside at that point. And my dad died in the middle of April of that, of that year. And because of the stage of the pandemic we were in, we couldn't gather, we couldn't see him when he was dying and we couldn't gather when he died. So as happened for many people, which obviously is very sad. And I always write, part of the reason I write is to make sense of the world. And the world was so out of control and unpredictable and unusual and sad at that point that I really needed to write. And I also do it to create another world. I really am only, I only feel okay if I have a fictional universe that I can live in and this world. If I only have this world, it's not enough for me. So that month in particular, I really needed to create another world. And so I dove into this book and Dear Edward, which is the prior book, took me eight years to write. And this one I wrote in two because A, pandemic, so I wasn't going anywhere and my children were doing less stuff and they were older as well. Um, and then I just wrote all the time. I felt like I, the, the book starts with this little boy named William Waters who, because of a tragedy in his family, his parents basically can't show him any love. And so he, I felt like I walked into this book with William and we were both lonely and sad and a bit heartbroken. And then he encounters these four Padovano sisters who are vibrant and strong-willed and boisterously love, love each other. And he was drawn to them and I was too. I felt like I needed them and I needed that love and connection and noise as much as he did. And it was like we both went through this book trying to see if we could be okay. Love that. And can you tell us where where did the sisters come from? So there's four sisters in the Padovano family. And um, can you tell us about the inspiration for those sisters? Sure. So when I, I have siblings, but um, when I was growing up, my best friend Leah lived right down the street from me. And actually we have the same last name, Napolitano. <laughs> and so our families became best friends really initially because we had the same last name. And I used to sleep at Leah's house like 50% of the time. And her mother, Cecilia, um, has six sisters. And they would come in and out of the house at all hours. And they were all about five feet tall. Most of them had curly hair. And they had slightly different versions of the same face. And they seemed more fully themselves when they were all in the same room together than when they were apart. And they fascinated me. I used to like watch them like they were TV. And I was just super shy. And there was so much going on in that house that I would just be like, <laughs> like watching them interact. Like in their house, in the, my friend Leah's house, her father, they designed this house. And the, in the kitchen, there were two islands. And one was low for all these five foot tall sisters. And one was normal height. Um, so like they really like ruled the roost in this delightful way. And the, the love that they had seemed rooted so deeply into the earth that it was like all the way through them to the fact that it even like took over what they looked like. And I wanted I was I wanted to write about that kind of sisterhood and that kind of deep love and connection, but also like that kind of relationship. Even if you have a found sister, but someone in your life you're not related to who occupies that role for you, where they're, they're more like family than friend, it can be really challenging because you hold each other accountable. You see the best in each other, but you also demand the best in each other. And you're, that's the friend who tells you to quit that job, leave that boyfriend. They tell you what you don't want to hear, but you need to hear. Yeah. Um, so that can be a very challenging relationship at the same time. And indeed, the sisters in the story, their commitment to each other is challenged. I think there's something about kids who are going to grow up to be writers that like one way of picking them out of the crowd is that they're the ones who are paying attention to adults and what they're doing mm -hmm. because I see like with my own kids it's like most kids are just like gonna run through your house and like get some snacks and play their games but like sometimes there's a kid who's like what is that what are the parents saying to each other and what is the what's the underlying you know vibe between them and I was totally that way of like studying adult behavior yeah, me too. The Padovano sisters. Was, is one of your kids doing that? 
Oh, well, Leo's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, very much like that, actually. <laughs> Terrifying. I want to make him <laughs> sign a non-disclosure agreement. Let's see if I write his name. Um, um, so I loved, you said, I think, I think this was in the Times, that you said that this story raced out of you. You described it as, it was like holding on to the fender of a car being banged across town. Yeah, I, th I, I mean, one of the interesting things about growing older is having more experience and more times at it. Mm -hmm. And to, for me, each book has been a different experience from the other ones. And this book is a, was a completely different experience. The book before it, Dear Edward, I felt like I walked into the world of Dear Edward when I started to write it, and I, it was like light and airy, and I loved being in there. Even though ostensibly it's a sad book, I actually found it a very joyful writing experience. And it took eight years, so it's good that it was joyful. Uh, but uh, this book, I felt like feverish with it. Like It felt like it was taking place inside me, and it was making me unwell basically, and the only way for me to have any peace was to do justice to these characters and find out like every tonal truth about them and the story and get it exactly right, and only then would I be okay, um, which sounds terrible. And it wasn't as terrible as it sounds, but it was very intense. Yeah, I, as, as someone who knows you well, I think it's very interesting, and hopefully I'm allowed to mention this, because now I'm mentioning it, how the, um, these characters have really stayed with you. Like you went through kind of a mourning period when you were done with the book. And maybe, I don't know if you're still in it, or maybe it's ended because you get to talk about it now and share these characters with people. But I feel like they were so, you know, your world, like so real. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you're a writer who's, well, I actually already know the answer, but for that, for that um, I think I know the answer. Like I've met novelists who feel that they are kind of the, puppet master and they know what's going to come and they know like how, sort of they're in control of their characters and then there are some novelists I'm definitely in this category I don't feel I have any control over my characters really I think they kind of do what they're going to do and I'm curious like how you feel about that or does it but change you know from one book to the next you know what your books are going to be about yes but they I, I feel like there's always surprises See, I don't know what my books are going to be about. I knew like five things that were going to happen in Hello Beautiful, yeah. but like those were at various points in the course of a story, and I had no idea how I was going to get to any one of them. Yeah. Um, so in the writing and thinking, not writing pretty sentences year, that's when I figure out these five things, and I more or less figure out who's in the story. But a lot of what I think I figure out and I take notes on actually doesn't appear on the page, because yeah. once I actually start writing, then uh, you know, the, the story demands to be told in its own way. What's the quote? I know I, you probably know it. If you don't, I know there are other people here who do about the, the, the head. Yeah, yeah. The doctor it's like my the favorite. Me too. I love that. I think all writers love it. Uh, so there's a obviously famous for writers, E.L. Doctor, a quote that writing a novel is like driving home on a foggy night. You can only see as far as the end of your headlights, but that's enough to get you home. You can see a bit, and then you see a bit more, and then you see a bit more. And that really is largely my experience for writing novels. I'll figure out one thing, and then I have no idea what's gonna happen next, but by the time I get halfway through that, I'm like, oh yeah, and then this will happen. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I always like to say, Anne, that you, I feel like you, you have so many different, um, there's so many different parts of your process to talk about. One is like your writer's group, which I'd love to talk about. Um, also, the fact that you're an incredible teacher, and, um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your kind of theory of obsessions mm -hmm. in, in fiction writing and what obsessions were you addressing in this book? Okay, so when I teach fiction writing, um, I always tell my students the same thing. Um, I don't know where I got, I obviously took this from somebody, I've had no original thoughts about the writing process or everything, it's, everyone's <laughs> had, you know, over time, but like what resonates with you is singular. So I always say, for everybody to imagine that you have a um, individually calibrated mag magnetic board in your torso. So picture like a rectangular magnetic board inside you. It is individually calibrated, so what pulls to your board is different than what pulls to your spouse or your best friend or your twin sister. Um, and you have to listen for what thwacks against your board because our world is so no noisy and you're always being told, oh, you have to read that book or like this is the great movie, this is a show you have to watch. And if you're not paying attention, you won't hear that like thwack that goes like, I really want to watch that documentary about mushrooms. I don't know why, but I really do. 
And you have to pay attention, if, particularly if you're an artist or a writer, you have to pay attention because what's pulling to your board, A, are the things that are gonna light you up and make you a more interested, interesting person. It adds value to your life. Um, oh yeah, I have, a, I have a Oprah, oh I told you, a light bulb Oprah thought too, I'll say that in a second. But, um, but if you're a writer, often what pulls to your board, the things that you're obsessed with, have something to do with your themes. So you really need to pay attention to that. You may not understand why, so like with Dear Edward, I became obsessed with a particular plane crash. A few years before I started writing Hello Beautiful, I still don't understand why, I became obsessed with the history of basketball. I have read so many books about the history of basketball that would blow your mind. I still listen to so many podcasts about basketball, it makes no sense at all. Do I play basketball? No. Have I ever played basketball? No. Do my children play basketball? Not really. We're soccer people, it's very strange. But I knew that this little boy who was so sad in the beginning of the book was going to dribble a basketball. And I wanted to write a lot more about the history of basketball in the novel than I ended up being allowed or able to write, <laughs> and that was that. Um, but that was, the, that was like the obsession, really, that I knew was going to weave its way. And each of my books has had some kind of obsession that fed into it in some weird way. And I say to my students, too, that if that obsession makes you uncomfortable, like it's something that you wouldn't choose to be obsessed with, that's an even greater sign that has something to do with whatever darker, murkier pulls that you have inside of you. I think I stole this quote from you, pay attention to what you pay attention to. Yes, yes, that's part of the talk. Um, which you don't know who you stole it from, I know who I stole it from, you. And then, but I give you credit when I teach you exactly what you teach. Um, huh. So, I'm curious to, like, I guess this kind of goes to obsessions, or maybe it's themes, or maybe it's both, I don't know, but um, one thing I have loved as a longtime fan of your books is the reviews for this book. Not only are they glowing, but when a writer has kind of reached a certain level, I feel like, you get the review that is looking at all your books and drawing, yeah. do you know what I mean? Drawing comparisons between them and, and the themes in them and all of that. And this um, this book seems to be like that book for you where all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I like that. Interesting, Actually, it's just talking I'm, about all the books. Because I'm 50 now. So no. I think it's like an age thing where they're like, well, she's done enough. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what do you think of when you think of sort of like themes or like what is the thing that you keep coming back to? Like I know Anne Patchett says every novelist just tells the same story over and over yeah. again with like a different setting. Mm -hmm. What do you think yours is? How to live a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. that's, oh, that's good. Yeah. I mean that's what I keep. <laughs> I keep putting people in these unusual situations and really, so like Dear Edward, there's a physical plane crash and this boy climbs out of a physical plane crash and I, I was like, can he be okay? Is there any way this little boy could be okay? And I did not know the answer and I wrote that book to find out whether he could be or not. In this book, William climbs out of an emotional crash of a family and I needed to find out whether he could be okay and I did not know if he could, so I had to find out. And so that is an exploration of what gives our lives meaning, how we can be kind and love and take care of each other. How, how, how powerful is that love and kindness? Can it actually heal or make us whole? Can it heal us enough that we can love ourselves and that makes us whole? It's all those things that are in all of my books now. Um, I was telling my friend, Janet, who's here tonight, that um, you are like my moral compass. Remember I was telling you that recently? And um, and I think there's something really interesting because you have this, you do have, like you're just a good, good, good human and you think so deeply about being human and take it really seriously. Um, and I, it's sort of how to be better in the world and how to make the world better and all of those things. And so, sorry. You are that too, aren't you? Yeah. Oh my God. But, <laughs> but. Nobody does more like beautiful activism help children, et cetera, than Courtney Sullivan. Thank you. Um, we're both amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that's, that's the best <laughs> But why was I telling you that you're my moral beacon? Oh, because what's interesting, I think, in this novel, all of your novels, but specifically in this one, like there are some choices that are made, and you're like, oh my god, I can't believe she did that. But I 
feel like the book still has this grounding in, in you in the sense of like love and uh, sort of bonds, whether they're like blood, you know, blood bonds between family members or chosen family members. So it adds this really fascinating dimension. I feel like when you just kind of describe the plot summary of some of the things that happen in the book, it's like, whoa, that's really shocking. But yeah. there's, it's so, there's this underpinning of so much sort of like love and compassion. I think, I don't know that that's true, but I, I am not judgmental. No, you're not. Like if you told me you killed somebody, I'd be like, okay, why? I did. <laughs> <laughs> and do you need help? Um, because I, as long as I, if you can understand, you know, something, somebody does something quote unquote terrible. Okay, oh, actually, well, in research, in, when I was going to go on Oprah or whatever, my publicist the week before was like, you really need to read this book that Oprah wrote that came out like a couple of years ago, 2019, I think. She wrote it with a doctor who specializes in trauma, and it's called What Happened to You. And it's a nonfiction book about tra trauma, and she has done a huge amount of work um, to solve, help child abuse. And this, so I was like, and they were like, you know, she may reference it, so you need to have read this book. So I listened to this book, and actually it was great. It was really interesting. And, um, oh, yes, and so my point is that with the, one of the premises of the book and why it's called that is that she was saying, they were saying, when someone falls apart or acts out a kid or grown up in some kind of dramatic way, our society and within our homes and our schools, we say, what's wrong with you? Like, what is wrong with that kid? And what we should say to each other is what happened to you? Mm -hmm. And if we said that as a society to the people that are broken, the amount of compassion and understanding in that question, it changes everything. And I, for whatever quirky of personality, I've, I've never been kind of judgmental. I mean, I'm always interested. And if I can understand why someone did what they did, then I'm like, that checks all the boxes. And I feel the same way for characters. Like, as long as it feels true, I'm not judging them for doing what they did. I mean, it, the consequences are bad enough, usually. They don't need my judgment on top of it. So, I think partly um, your kind of, like, sort of radical empathy factor in your books mm -hmm. um, is, I think having multiple viewpoints is a big part of it because you take you know one event or one series of events and you have these all these different ways of looking at those events mm -hmm. and so i'm curious in this book how did you know which voices to amplify in the family like who gets to speak and who doesn't um and were there ever any where you i always end up writing like five more points of view than i have in the book yeah. um so i'm curious who did you write um who didn't end up in the book yeah i and i love I love going into different characters' heads. It's like one of my favorite things to do. And if I had my druthers, I would go into everybody's head. Yeah. But it doesn't make for a good reading experience. Um, so with this book, I it's a following the story and who do you need to tell the story from. And there are four people in the book, uh, William and two of the sisters, and then um, a child who have point of views. And I also had two other point of views that my editor and agent were like, too many. And that was Rose, the mother of the four girls. Oh, she had a couple chapters. Oh. And then Izzy, who is um, one of the oh. grandchildren, basically, um, she had a chapter too. It's useful, I feel like, as yeah. a writer, because you, then you at least know this yeah. stuff. Right? You find stuff out by writing those yeah, chapters you anyway. Stuff out. Yeah. I want to read those chapters. <laughs> Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, what else do I want to ask you about? So I want to ask you about this sort of, uh, it kind of goes back to, to basketball. So can you tell us how basketball, like what role it plays in the novel? Mm -hmm. um, and then I have a question. I just want to see how much you share and then I'll ask a question or not. Depending on what you share. Okay. okay. Sure. Um, so William is a basketball player. He's identified as a basketball player when he's a kid, and then he's like, the fact that someone saw him as something makes him take on that identity. He's like, well, that must be who I am, and it becomes very important to him. And actually, I also learned in the Oprah book something that, that I should read. Um, that uh, we rhythm, rhythm is regulation. 
So that's why part of why we rock babies because it helps regulate them when they're upset, and that's why um, that's why we feel better when we go for a walk or like a kid go in the backyard with your kid and throw a ball back and forth when they're upset, and it helps them calm down because the rhythm soothes us, and it's a way for us to self soothe, and we can use that actively to know like oh, I'm feeling, you know, in my feelings I'm gonna go move, and I think that. William, who has no, no one is soothing him from the outside, so he dribbles the basketball to regulate himself. Um, and the sound is comforting to him, and the motion is comforting to him. And he ends up writing a book about basketball, the, the history of basketball, basically, and different like critical scenes in the history of basketball, uh, which again, I wanted to be like 50% of the book, and it's <laughs> a scant like 3%, um, if that. Um, yeah, I guess that's the, and then also teamwork. That actually is another really big thing. So someone like William who is, has, is broken and damaged and sweet, um, it's almost impossible for someone like that to feel like they deserve friends or to make friends. But if you join a team, the framework of being part of a team is like a wonderful thing for the misfits among us and the non-misfits. Um, and also you look, it's like a, it is a caring framework where you all look out for each other and you all have different roles and you're not meant to be the same. And so that's the first place that he finds friendship. And those, those friends are his team for the rest of his life, even though they stop being, technically being teammates. So that was really interesting and fun to explore too. And I, I, I did play soccer all the way through the end of high school, so I was on teams. And it, it is like, a, there's like a magical alchemy to it, that can be really wonderful. Um, his best friend, Kent, who I always want to call Clark, because Clark Kent, um, <laughs> but it's Kent. Um, I, I love their friendship. It's one of my favorite relationships in this book full of relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, you know, I think it's really fascinating, I don't think this gives too much away, that, that you know, William, as any young person who loves something and is passionate about something, you know, in his case, basketball, um, of course it's sort of his dream that this will be his life, to be a basketball player. Mm -hmm. And it isn't his life, but it's really interesting how basketball remains a thing for him. Yeah. Um, I think about, you know, you telling me the very first time we ever had lunch together, years and years ago, that you know, you were certain of two things in life, that you would be a writer and be a mother. And when it was, was like not 12. about, yeah, it was not about, you know. I was a weird 12 year old. <laughs> but it was not about like, I'm gonna be Oprah's 100th book club pick. It was I'm going to write, because you loved to write. And um, I don't know, I just think that's sort of interesting, the role that work plays in your book, mm -hmm. because, um, the jobs people have, the things that they do professionally tend to say a lot about them, I thought. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think that's right. I mean, we have a librarian book. We yeah. have a, someone who takes care of very little children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's the jobs that they have in the book are a reflection of who they are. Um, there's a, one of the sisters is really loving and nurturing, and she works in a daycare. Um, Cecilia, one of the sisters, is an artist, and her art sort of shapes the lives of their family as well. And um, the oldest sister becomes a businesswoman, basically, which is she is the one who wants to try to control life. So it seems fitting that she like strides into a boardroom. Yeah. Um, and I do think people get led to their life work by different whether they want to prove themselves or they want to be themselves. Mm, and, that's interesting. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. That's interesting. I just made that up on the I spot. I'm not, sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I completely believe that. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I want to ask you a couple of things that aren't really about your book. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, some of you may know that Oprah told Anne, she said, Anne, you are my rock star. <laughs> and um, well, she said writers are. Well, she rock said stars. writers are my rock stars. But then she actually touched Anne and said, "Anne, you are my rock star." And so I just wanted to say that Anne um, once worked for a rock star. Uh, Sting. Anne was Sting's 
Sorry. Were you his personal assistant? I was one of his personal assistants. One of his personal assistants <laughs> for many years. And I'm just, I always think it's interesting, like, what other jobs writers have had. Mm -hmm. So did you learn anything about writing in that time? Or were you writing in that time? Oh, yeah. They do. I was, so I, was, I went to graduate school at NYU. And while I was there, I worked at Barnes & Noble in Union Square. We actually opened that store like as staff. And um, this is how long ago that was. The store's been there for a long time. And uh, my, my boss at Barnes & Noble, who's still one of my best friends, Stacy, who's my age, um, she worked in PR but was taking a break. And she was doing PR for a self-help writer. And I ended up working. I, was, I come from very organized type A stock. And so very professional, very punctual, frighteningly punctual. And um, so I went to work for the self-help writer as part-time uh, personal assistant, I, not like I had training in being a personal assistant, but I was in graduate school and it worked really well. And then while I was working there, she was also doing PR for Sting's wife and they needed help stuffing their Christmas cards one year as like a project. <laughs> and so my friend was like, well, I have this great friend who also is doing this kind of thing. And so I went and helped them stuff their credit, their credit cards, stuff their <laughs> Christmas cards. And um, they liked me. And then I did a couple more projects, and then they wanted to hire me. And I said to them, well, I'm an aspiring I had not published anything. I was like 23 or 24 years old. Um, and I was like, I'm an aspiring writer. And so they made a deal with me that I would, when they were in the country, meaning this country, I worked seven days a week. And then when they weren't in the country, I worked four days a week. So it ended up being like six months of the year that they were in the country. So it was great. So I would have Fridays off to write, and I wrote. Uh, a couple books that way. Did you live with them? No. Oh. <laughs> oh well, I did when they were in like California. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Not in New York. I didn't live with them. Though. I mean, Sting did such a good job hiring you because Anne is so discreet. I think we were friends for ten years before she was just like, oh, I used to have to wake up Sting every morning. I'm like, what? <laughs> and then, and she never really, never really, you know, go into that. But I, I, mean, I just really that. hope that, that was Sting was watching job. when I ever called <laughs> you. Her personal rock star. Um, and I'm, I'm also curious, so when you, um, Anne is in a, an incredible uh, trio um, with two other fabulous writers, Helen Ellis and Hannah Tinti. They're in a writer's group together. And if, can you tell everyone a little bit about the three of you? And I, I also love Helen's job that she had when you guys were all starting out. Oh, yeah. My husband says we shouldn't call it a group because it's only three people, and three people is not a group. Oh, what is it? I don't know. I guess, but that sounds so weird if we talk about ourselves as a trio. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like we're like musically incorrect yeah. or something. We're going to pull out our ukuleles, which yeah. Hannah, Hannah does play the ukulele. Yeah, that's true. Um, we met in graduate school at NYU in Danny Shapiro, the writer's um, workshop. And Danny Shapiro actually suggested at some point during the semester that like we should you know, if you see a friend, someone in the class who you feel like you have some kinship with, you should start meeting outside of class during the summer. And Helen, who's like the alpha of our trio, who's from Alabama, and she worked in Talbots when we were in graduate school. So she would come to class wearing these like silk blouses with like the fancy <laughs> things. And I was always wearing sweatpants and Converse sneakers. And Hannah is like super cool. Like she's, she wears her hair in braids and um, she always like DJing parties and like it, we were all really different and we still are really different. And um, we started meeting once a week and reading each other's work and now it's been something like 27 years and we still are each other's first readers. And um, I think of it more as like a marriage, like the three of us are like very committed to each other um, and take care of each other. And we've gone through, ups, each of us, has gone through ups and downs personally and professionally. And um, we're I'm really lucky, you know, to have them to read my work. Uh, those are the two friends she told about Oprah. Oh, yeah. early. And we all worked as secretaries in the beginning, that's what you were saying. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And Helen was like she worked for like the chairman of Chanel. She worked for the two brothers that ran Chanel. Amazing. And then <laughs> Hannah worked for the guy who ran um, Howard Stringer who ran Time Warner, something like that. Um, okay, one other thing that's not about your book, but it is about you as a person, as a writer, I think. Um, and you've written about this before, but can you tell us about the letters? I love this about you. The letters that you write to yourself every 10 years. Okay. 
when I was 14, I read, well, I read everything as a child. I was a voracious reader, and I read all of the books by L.M.M. M. Montgomery. Mm -hmm. I think I'm saying that right, the woman who wrote the Anne of Green Gables series. She wrote another series called Emily of New Moon, which is also wonderful. And Emily, in the Emily books, when she's 14, she writes a letter to herself 10 years later with what her hopes and dreams are for her 24-year-old self. And I was 14 when I read that. It was like, as I recall, it was like late at night, and I was like alone in my room, and I, I read that, and I was like, I put down the book, and I like found a pad of paper, and I wrote a letter to myself when I was 24. Um, about what I, I like, of course, I hoped I lived in like a Soho loft. You know, it's like a very like Parker Posey um, <laughs> you know, of its time dream. It was a, like an all white, enormous like loft in Manhattan. And I was a writer, of course. Um, and then I sealed, I, I folded it up that night and sealed it and wrote, you know, to Anne at 24 from Anne at 14. And just by some act of miracle, I held on to that letter for 10 years. I wanted to open it the next day, I wanted to open it the next week. When I was 14, it was really hard, like 10 years is a very long time, as it turns out. And when you're 14, it's like an unbelievably long time. And then it's amazing I didn't lose it. So and I've done that now. You're so well organized, like you said. It's I guess that's amazing. it. Well, I would have lost Go to college, oh, I mean, there's sure. like impossible. So I'm now waiting to open my 54 one in three years. So I have. What if your 44 year old self was like, I hope I'm the 100th book club? I did not say that. And I would never <laughs> entered my mind in a million years that anything like that would happen. Um, um, on that note, um, we're going to turn it over to questions from the lovely audience. Um, and I'm going to uh, repeat your question just so everybody can, can hear. Um, so who wants to be the first question asker? It can be intimidating, but I know you're out there, I feel it. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to say that the opening few, well, 1%, I read on a general, the opening 1% of this book was so enthralling that I had to remind myself to breathe. So thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank she you. said the opening of the book was so enthralling she had to remind herself to breathe. I just want to repeat these seconds. But my question <laughs> is about how you decided when to stop doling out the story in month-long bits and telling the story over a longer time. I would have preferred just to see every month of these people's lives on <laughs> infinity, but that's a large book. It's 30 years long. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not a very large book, they heard it. Long, so I didn't think you were gonna do that. But how did you decide that you were at a point in the story where you could stop so microscopic and move into that bigger time frame? That's a great question. It's it, mostly by feel and I knew like I knew like like I said I knew like five things and most of them happened when they're grown-ups so like I, I had to get there and I needed to get there you know fairly quickly because that was where the story lay but you needed to know these people so the you know the first few chapters have to be a little slower so that you actually have time to meet them and understand them and have scenes with the sisters together and lay the groundwork for the story and the rest of the book, and then I needed to figure out how I could get them to where the, the bigger stuff happens. Um. Next time, though, every month. <laughs> I, I so agree with you about the opening of this book. I was like completely blown away by it. I just could not stop reading the book for anything. It's just like one of those books that you feel like you don't want to stop reading, but also you're really sad because you know it's gonna end. I mean, that's why you want every month. Give her the chapters written from the other point of view. Yes, in the back. Um, I think your, your um, interest in basketball is fascinating. You know, I, I never expected you to study that. And I just want to know how, you know, your, all your comprehensive knowledge now of basketball has shaped you in your life. Oh, that's a great Ooh, I question. I love that question. <laughs> well, can everybody, hear, can everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay, sorry. That's a great question. And I don't know the answer to it, really. I know that my family now watches the Golden State Warriors together, and it's like our happy time. Um, and I, I love the characters in the NBA. I mean, they're great stories. They really are. And, like, Steph Curry is this incredibly joyful, elite athlete that we're lucky to have the opportunity to watch right now. LeBron James has like 
built his body, his life, and his career with this fastidious brilliance that's fascinating. Like there's just, so it feeds me in all, like a storytelling way. Um, and I think basketball also, just because you see them up close, like I, my husband is English, and I've also watched a lot of Premier League soccer over the years, but they're so far away. Like the field is so big. Like basketball, it's like you know these people. Like I feel like I could tell you everyone who's on the Golden State roster and like how they grew up. Um, so that's how it feeds my life at the moment. Well, thank you. Oh. I was going to ask that same question, but now my brain is Part two of that would be, how do you do March Madness practice? No, I'm not, I haven't gotten into college basketball. I actually really want to get into the WNBA, too. I, I do follow that loosely, but I, I want to follow it more. Um, it's like a time issue, and I'm so invested already in the NBA characters that it's hard for me <laughs> to expand out. But I am following the WNBA, too. I can think college. I can't take that on, too. Yeah. I feel like it's very similar for me to writing in that I feel like I feel like it's really important when I'm teaching a class like I can't really do both is the thing I can't write and teach because I put so much time into the teaching and preparing and the thinking about the students works and I feel like it's so it's like a, a work a writing workshop is like it should be like a really safe sacred risk-taking place so like you have to create this world for your students and then you have to you know guide that world and it's really rewarding and really moving and you end up talking about all this real life stuff because everybody's writing about heartbreak and love and grief and so you end up sharing things and it's very intense um, it's a labor of love for me and I do find that I have to like do it intermittently or else I can't, uh, I wouldn't be able to write. I think it's so, Anne teaches much more than I do. I've only done it like little one-offs here or there, but um, I, I think partly too it's helpful because when you're a writer, you never feel like, oh, I've got this in the back. I've written all these novels now. I know how to do this. Um, so it can be kind of helpful to like teach because as you're doing it, you're like, oh yeah, that's a good point. I, I, you know, you're always sort of, it, it, there's not like, um, 20 years worth of stuff to learn about how to write fiction. There's maybe like eight weeks, eight weeks worth, yeah. So, you know, you just keep coming back to the same ideas, really. Um, and I remember that when I first taught, I was like so worried and asking Anne what to do. And I, I often think about this, even with my own small children, that you were like, well, you can't ask anyone, like, is the room cool enough? Is the room warm enough? Like, you just have to open the window. And, okay. Yeah. So like, yeah. you know. This well, someone told me that when I started. Like, the, you have to make all the decisions. Yes. Like, if you want to open a window, you're the one who decides. Yes. Don't let someone of your students decide. Yeah. Like, you're the decider. So I'm like thing. opening the window, and in my head, like, oh my god, I'm opening the window. Is everybody okay? Yes, I'm just with what you do. Um, but yeah, it is. I mean, it, it's um, obviously people write for so many different reasons. Um, many want to be published, but even among those, I think there's there's so much sort of emotional weight. And in a really good workshop, it can be, you know, it can be almost like therapeutic sometimes yeah. for people, um, which is wonderful and also can be a lot. So it is like hard to be writing and doing that at the same time. I love this book so much that I, I teach and I proselytize it to my college students today in both of my classes because this book, you have such empathy and warmth for these people who are not only easy people to love, but you make them all lovable. And I, I don't want to give anything away, but I cried so hard at the end I could barely see. Like I couldn't read the words on the page, but in a good way, like just in a cathartic, engaging way. I just loved it so much and now I'm totally going to uh, but oh, I don't know when. <laughs> um, but the last, I was wondering when you wrote the last line of the book, because the last line of the book, I thought, really demonstrated so much growth, and I don't think for the person who said that line, but for all the characters. Well, I can't really give away what the last line is, obviously. Um, I won't, don't worry. Um, I was surprised. Like, there... There are, I read, well, okay, so George Saunders, who's a brilliant writer and writes brilliant short stories, and he actually writes, he, he's a master teacher too. He's, I don't know, 
of Syracuse, is that where he was? Yeah, Syracuse. And he wrote a teacher. I'm, I went to Oh, she went to Syracuse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and a teacher. <laughs> um, he, had a, he writes so well about writing. And he read an essay in The Guardian a couple of years ago. And he, it, the essay was about his experience of writing a novel after having written short stories for so long. And um, he was saying that basically writing a story short or long is like there's three parts. You pick up the bowling pins from the ground, you throw them in the air, and then you try to catch them. And he said the difference between a short story and a novel is that you're throwing like 47 bowling pins up in the air with a uh, novel. And he said for him it was fascinating the sort of intricate movements in the air and, and the coming back together in ways that he had not anticipated with so many more parts. And he was saying that it really, what probably explains like how we do that, like how that the writer comes to these movements at the end is uh, that we are pattern recognition machines. And so our brain is like, you've brought in these 47 elements and some deep part of your subconscious is working on how they could possibly be stitched together because we have to make a pattern out of them. And I find the pattern that comes together at the end, I don't know what's gonna happen at the end. I don't, there were things, there were coming togethers and, and growths that I did not even think were on the table for these characters that happened. And I think it's because we're uh, pattern making machines and it was, very moving for me, you know, to to have the characters go where they went, um, and I'm you know glad they did. I'm sorry I made you cry. So. No, it was a good cry. It was like the you know I feel like if it, you know I cry they they're both too Courtney. Like I think if you cry you're so engaged. You're, so, you're really like emotionally engaged with the work. I think. Yeah. yeah. How do you keep the regular life, your mental book, and everything else together? I, I like I have my I have two sons and they're 13 and 15 and I stopped having a schedule 15 years ago um, coincidentally with the birth of my first child I don't know how that happened um, so even now they come you know it's like there are different there are different you know chapters in our lives I always say this to my students too like if you have a newborn baby and a two-year-old you know you've got to cut yourself some major slack like your bandwidth is like that big you may want to write and need to write even but what you are producing you cannot expect to be what it is at other times in your life or if you have a sick parent or you're suffering from depression you know there are these moments where there are other issues that you have to give yourself grace um, during this book it the fact that it was two years i i was able to for whatever reason because of the pandemic etc really sort of make writing a much bigger part of my life and my insides than i ever have before i've always more or less put my kids first you know my life first and then fit in the writing around the margins as much as i could because if i don't write i get sad and i don't feel whole if i'm not writing and i really you know, never expected to be successful at all. I wrote two books in my 20s that never got published. The two books that I wrote, essentially in my 30s, had very few readers. Um, but I, I wrote, you know, because it stitches things together inside me, and I need to do it to be my whole self. Um, yes, does that answer your question? Yeah. You mentioned, uh, the introduction mentioned the homage to Little Women. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that and how it came to society? Yeah, I did not intend to write an homage to Little Women. <laughs> um, I wrote these four sisters, and there was a scene in the book when I was writing where they were arguing with each other over which March sister they were. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh yeah, four sisters, four sisters. <laughs> and then I was like, oh yeah, but Lori is like the lonely boy next door in Aww. Little Women, and William is the lonely boy in this book. And once I saw it, then I saw it. And then I was like, oh my gosh, of course they would compare each other and fight over who's Joe. Like, I mean, I, I had fights with myself over, you know, I wanted to be Joe.
show. Nobody, my sister was like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not reading that long book. I think that's the best part is that both sisters are like, I'm Joe. No, yeah. I'm Joe. Everybody wants to be um, Joe. And then, like, the point, you know, they point out, oh my God, one of us will be Beth. Yeah. Oh, um, so yeah. Um, I was curious, do you actually like Little Women? Yeah, I do. Okay. Because it's very polarizing, I've found, um, among women writers. Um, What's I, the anti stance? Just that some women writers just hate little women. They just did not like that book. Oh. And so when Oprah was like, Anne, do you love little women? You love little women. And I was like, well, she's not going to say she does. But I was curious. Do you? Oh, yeah, I love little women. Oh. Here. Um, is there one more? We, I think we have time for one more. I just wanted to ask her how life has changed since last Tuesday. Oh, gosh. <laughs> how has her life changed since last Tuesday? Well, it was the craziest week I've ever had, probably. I mean, it just still doesn't feel real to me. And I don't feel, I feel a little guilty. I feel like, because this wasn't like something that I dreamed of, and a lot of writers do. I'm like, you know, I'm like a head in the sand, bumbling, like doing my, doing what I need to do, and I'm loving what I do, et cetera. Um, so many people have emailed me. Um, so many people have called me. Um, I've been asked to do a lot of like literary festivals and things like that. It's been really wonderful and overwhelming. And Michelle Obama tweeted at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, it was for Oprah. <laughs> she just said the hundredth book pick was "Hello, Beautiful" by Anne Um Yeah, there was some wild stuff that happened on social media. Um, I got like two thousand new followers in one day. Um, yeah, it was very exciting. Does Sting know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking her that myself. She did. Yeah, I don't know if Sting knows. <laughs> I told her, I feel like he's going to be calling. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have an idea. Yeah, so I was I was really sad when I finished this book. Um, I think partly because it only took two years. So usually by the time I finish a book, I'm kind of more sick of it. And I was not sick of these people. And I wasn't sick of this world. And I was really sad to leave it. I was really sad for like two months. And then I got an, an idea. So that, that means now I have that second you know, world going to some extent. I'll probably start writing pretty sentences in June. I hope. <laughs> How did you feel about Dear Edward on the screen? The TV show? Yeah. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. I mean, um, I writers go two ways. Well, A, it's a miracle if you're, you know, a lot many books get optioned, which means they have the chance to make it if they want to. But actually having a show that becomes a show is like a, a, a miracle, basically. How long in advance does it get optioned? It got optioned in. Um, 2020. So this was very fast. The book came out in 2020. I met with Jason Kadams, who is the showrunner who made Friday Night Lights and Parenthood. And he was kind of like, so writers either really want to be involved in their show. Some of them write on it or write it, do it themselves. Some of them want nothing to do with it. I am of the want nothing to do with it category because I really want to write novels and I don't know how to write a show. And um, he was like, I don't want you to be involved. Like, I want to do it my way. And I was like, great, we're on the same page. And I really respect him as a writer and a creator. And I was like, I'm interested to see what you do. And he was like, I'm going to change things. And I was like, great. So um, it's, you know, I, I was just curious. And so it's been a really pleasant surprise. I, I was saying to Courtney, I think, that I met the little boy who played Edward twice. I met him, I went to the set once. And when they were at Central Park last summer, and um, he walked towards me and I almost started crying. And I was so surprised because I don't cry normally. And also I wasn't expecting that, but it was like watching my heart walk towards me. Because it was like, he's playing this boy that I carried inside me for eight years. And then I saw him again in January and I had the same reaction to this poor little boy who was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird middle-aged lady that tears up every time she sees him. <laughs> He's just a little boy named Colin. <laughs> so I'm, he's not actually Edward. <laughs> but to me, he is. So that's really very special. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, guys. Thank you.